Did it ever occur to you that if you changed the last I in Kid Cudi's name to an L, he becomes Kid Cuddle? That doesn't have anything to do with today's video. I just thought it was funny. And adorable. Greetings one and all and welcome once again to Tom's Hit Parade. I'll be bringing you some backtracks today. Backtracks is my monthly roundup of notable album anniversaries, divisible by five, with at least one spotlight album review. Uh, but Backtracks is going to be a little bit different this month. Uh, as you might have noticed by the shorter runtime down in the progress bar down there. Uh, yes, I've decided to only do one shout out per target year this month as opposed to the usual two. Uh, a couple of diff different reasons for that. Uh, first of all, I've noticed this the last couple of Decembers uh, previous, uh, but it was seems to be more of an apparent problem this year, and is that, that is that December historically has been a rather lean month for album releases. Uh, I was somehow able in the last two, the previous two Decembers, to find enough uh, albums of reasonable note and enough to say about those albums to flesh out backtracks into its full length, but didn't quite happen this year. I was looking at some albums that were arguably rather obscure albums, and I don't like to talk about obscure albums unless I have a connection to them. And so, uh, you know, about two-thirds of the way through making the notes for the video, I decided, screw it, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do an abbreviated backtracks. Uh, first of all, I'm, I've got quite a few more videos coming out uh, before the end of this month, hopefully, or right around New Year's anyway, so you're gonna have plenty more content anyway from me, th from me this month. But also, and for that reason, uh, the idea of making backtracks a little uh, easier on me, you know, giving myself half the work for this video was very, very appealing to me. So for that reason, I've decided uh, probably for every December going forward, not every month, just December, you, I'll probably be doing this half-length backtracks, backtracks light, I guess you'd say, uh, for you. And uh, might happen with other months uh, as we progress. I don't know how many albums of note are, be are coming out this coming February. I haven't looked yet, so that could possibly be an abbreviated Backtracks as well, but we'll see. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But for now, let's go ahead and take a look at some of the albums that are celebrating anniversaries for the month of December 2020. In December of 1955, Bill Haley and his Comets released Rock Around the Clock, their third full-length album and their first to reach the Billboard Albums chart, where it peaked at number 12. This 12-song collection of Haley singles was an expansion of an 8-song set released earlier in the year. It's notable in that it was the first album bearing the title track to be released after it became a hit single, enjoying an 8-week run at number 1 on the pop chart, thanks to its appearance in the film Blackboard Jungle, having been handpicked by the movie star Glenn Ford from the personal record collection of his son. The song was originally the B-side of the single 13 Women, released a year and a half earlier. Sixty years ago this month saw the release of drummer Max Roach's album We Insist, Freedom Now Sweet. Accompanied by vocalist Abby Lincoln and featuring Booker Little on trumpet, James Schenck on bass, and saxophone by Walter Benton and Coleman Hawkins, it was a concept album built around the upcoming 100th anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, and as such was one of the first jazz albums to address contemporary social issues. Its poor commercial performance may have been a result of the controversy sparked by the album's social commentary, made all the more direct by the cover photo's depiction of the Greensboro lunch counter sit-in protests that took place through the first half of 1960. Happy 55th anniversary this month to the UK release of The Who's debut album My Generation. It peaked at number 5 on the UK albums chart and number 14 in Germany. The single release of the title track reached number 2 on the UK and Australian singles charts, number 3 in Canada, and went top 10 in Germany, the Netherlands, and Austria, but only climbed as high as number 74 in the US. Follow-up single, A Legal Matter, reached the top 20 in the Netherlands and the top 40 in the UK, while The Kids Are Alright just missed the top 40 in the UK and never reached the Billboard Hot 100. The album also features covers of two James Brown songs, I Don't Mind and Please Please Please, as well as the Bo Diddley hit, I'm a Man. Believe it or not, when it was released four months later in the US, the album failed to chart on the Billboard 200. Half a century ago this month, Creedence Clearwater Revival released their sixth album, Pendulum. It topped the album's charts in Australia and Norway, reached number two in the Netherlands and Canada, peaked at number five in the US and number eight in the UK. Their final album to be produced solely by John Fogarty, and their last to feature his brother Tom, who'd go on to a solo career, it spawned two top ten hits, Hey Tonight and Have You Ever Seen the Rain, both of which climbed to number eight on the Billboard Hot 100. 
In addition to being a departure from the guitar-dominated sound of their previous albums, instead featuring more emphasis on keyboards and saxophone, this was also the only CCR album whose tracklist included no cover songs. In December of 1975, Emmy Lou Harris released her third album, Elite Hotel. The follow-up to her acclaimed release, Pieces of the Sky, it was her first album to top the Billboard Country Albums chart, and it peaked at number 25 on the Billboard 200. It reached number 3 in the Netherlands and was a top 20 album in the UK. Her covers of Buck Owens' Together Again and Patsy Cline's Sweet Dreams became her first two number one hits on the country singles chart in the US. Subsequent single, One of These Days, peaked at number three. The album also includes covers of Hank Williams' Jambalaya and the Beatles song Here, There, and Everywhere. This album scored Harris her first Grammy win for female country vocal performance. Forty years ago this month, The Clash released their fourth album, Sandinista. It peaked at number three in Canada and New Zealand, number eight in Norway, number nine in Sweden, number 19 in the UK, and number 24 in the US. It boasts a mix of genre influences including calypso, reggae, folk, gospel, and jazz. Singles The Call Up and The Magnificent Seven reached the top 40 of the UK charts, while Police On My Back climbed to number 21 on the Billboard Mainstream Rock Tracks chart. Subsequent single Hitsville UK reached the top 60 of the UK singles chart and the Billboard Mainstream Rock chart. To get the label to agree to release this triple album at a lower price, just one year after their double album London Calling, mind you, the band members agreed to a cut in royalties. Sandinista topped Village Voice's Paz and Jop Critics poll for 1981 and also appears on Rolling Stone's list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. In December of 1985, Fine Young Cannibals released their self-titled debut album. It only peaked at number 49 in the US, but it reached number 21 in Canada and the Netherlands, number 11 in New Zealand and the UK, and number 2 in Australia. It currently holds platinum certification in Canada and gold status in the UK. Debut single Johnny Come Home climbed to number 8 on the UK singles chart, as did their cover of Suspicious Minds, originally hit for Elvis Presley in 1969. Johnny Come Home was also a top 10 hit in Belgium, Ireland, and the Netherlands, and along with their second single, Blue, reached number 9 on the Billboard Dance Songs chart. Suspicious Minds went top 10 in Australia and Ireland, and Blue reached the top 20 in Australia. The band's name, by the way, came from the title of the 1960 Robert Wagner and Natalie Wood film, All the Fine Young Cannibals. Happy 30th anniversary this month to CNC Music Factory's debut album, Gonna Make You Sweat. It peaked at number 2 on the Billboard 200, number 11 on the Billboard R&B Albums chart, and was a top 10 album in Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. The title track was a number 1 single in Germany, the Netherlands, and Switzerland, and on the Billboard Hot 100. It reached number 3 in the UK and Australia. Subsequent single, Things That Make You Go Hmm, reached number 6 in Australia and went top 5 in New Zealand and the UK. And, along with Here We Go, Let's Rock and Roll, reached the top 5 of the Billboard Hot 100. All four singles released from the album, the last one being Just a Touch of Love, topped the Billboard Dance Songs chart. CNC Music Factory was formed by production duo Robert Clivius and David Cole, and featured vocalists including Martha Wash, Freedom Williams, and Zelma Davis. December of 1995 saw the release of Enya's fourth album, The Memory of Trees. It topped the album's charts in six countries, including Australia, Ireland, and Norway, and was a top ten album in nine others, reaching number three in Belgium, number four in Canada, number five in the UK, and number nine in the US. It currently holds triple platinum certifications in the US, Japan, and Spain, and four times platinum in Australia. The album's first single, Anywhere Is, went top ten in the UK, Ireland, and Austria, and top twenty in the Netherlands. Follow-up single, On My Way Home, charted in the UK top forty. It was her highest charting album up to that point in the US, Sweden, the Netherlands, Canada, and Australia. In addition to playing all the instruments on the album and composing the music for each track, Enya sings the songs on this album in English, Spanish, Irish, and Latin. Twenty years ago this month saw the release of the soundtrack from the Coen Brothers film Oh Brother Where Art Thou? Produced by T-Bone Burnett, it spent over a decade on the Billboard soundtracks chart, two years on both the Billboard 200 and Billboard Country Albums charts, and 22 weeks on the Billboard Bluegrass chart, reaching number one on each. It peaked at number three on the Canadian Albums chart, number nine in France, and number 15 in Australia. Featuring artists such as Alison Krauss, Emmylou Harris, Ralph Stanley, and Norman Blake, 
performing traditional spirituals, country, blues, and folk classics including You Are My Sunshine, I'll Fly Away, Lonesome Valley, and most prominently, I Am a Man of Constant Sorrow. The soundtrack won Album of the Year awards from the Country Music Association, the Academy of Country Music, and the International Bluegrass Music Association, as well as three Grammy awards including Album of the Year. Within three months, the album had gone platinum, a certification that has since earned eight times over. In December of 2005, Mary J. Blige released her seventh album, The Breakthrough. It topped the R&B albums charts in both the US and Australia, as well as the Billboard 200. It reached number four on the UK R&B albums chart and number 13 on the primary Canadian albums chart. Lead-off single, Be Without You, went number one on the Billboard R&B singles chart and peaked at number three on the Billboard Hot 100 while going top 10 in the Netherlands and New Zealand. Follow-up track, One, a reworking of the U2 hit featuring the band, climbed to number 2 in the UK, the Netherlands, and Ireland, but stalled at number 82 in the US. Enough Crying was a top 40 hit in the US, but just missed the top 40 in the UK, although along with next single, Take Me As I Am, it reached the top 5 of the Billboard R&B chart. Be Without You and One were both top 5 singles in Switzerland. The Breakthrough received a Grammy Award for Best R&B Album, and Be Without You racked up nominations for Record of the Year and Song of the Year, and wins for Best R&B Song and Female R&B Vocal Performance. Ten years ago this month, Duran Duran released their 13th album, All You Need Is Now. Produced by Mark Ronson, the album peaked at number 11 on the UK Albums Chart and number 29 on the Billboard 200. It reached number 10 in Italy, number 16 in Russia, and number 23 in the Netherlands. The title track climbed to number 38 on the Billboard Adult Pop Songs chart and charted in Italy and Belgium, but was not eligible for the UK singles chart because it had been released as a free download. Subsequent single, Leave a Light On, reached number 31 on the Billboard Adult Pop Songs chart. The album features vocal assists from Khalees on the album track The Man Who Stole a Leopard and Scissor Sisters' Animatronic on Safe in the Heat of the Moment. In December of 2015, Troy Sivan released his full-length debut album, Blue Neighborhood. It peaked at number 3 in New Zealand, number 6 in Australia, number 7 in the US, and number 11 in Canada. The single Wild, the title track from the pre-release EP, went top 20 in Australia and top 40 in New Zealand. Youth also charted in the Australian Top 20 and was a Top 40 single in the US, New Zealand, and Germany. Talk Me Down climbed to number 36 in Australia, while a re-release of Wild featuring Canadian singer Alessia Cara peaked at number 26 in Australia. At the ARIA Awards, the Australian Grammys, Youth won both Song of the Year and Best Video, while the album garnered four nominations, Album of the Year and Best Pop Release, along with Alexandra Hope's two nominations for Producer of the Year and Engineer of the Year, with Troy himself being nominated for Best Male Artist. All right, now let's head on into the Spotlight album selection for this month. Uh, yes, I'm only doing one Spotlight album this month. I guess it's to kind of go along with the shortened shout-out section of the video as well. Uh, but it wasn't for lack of trying. I did actually try to find a second Spotlight album selection for this month, but I was not able to. But this one is a an album of suitable stature. I decided if I'm only going to do one, I'm going to make it a good one. And this is, this is a good one in several different ways. Uh, it was released in December of 1975, so it is 45 years old this month. It is Horses, the debut album by Patti Smith. And uh, as most of you know, this is a rather landmark recording in the world of punk rock music. Uh, but for some reason, oddly, it only reached number 47 on the Billboard 200. Uh, but it was a, a, a top 20 album in the Netherlands. It reached number 18 in the Netherlands. So uh, it got some success in some parts of the world. And of course, you know, in retrospect, this has become an absolute classic album. And I can kind of see why after listening to it. Now, I, I have made it no secret over the course of this channel that I am not a huge fan of punk rock. I've just personally not found a whole lot in that genre to like thus far. Uh, but I have been trying to expose myself to it more and more. And I figured that this album was a really good place to start, uh, considering the uh, huge reputation that it has, not just in punk, but in music in general. Uh, but honestly, calling this a punk album doesn't do it justice. Uh, is as, I, as in the same way that I kind of discovered with The Clash's London Calling, calling that one just a punk album really sells it short, honestly, way, way short. Uh, although, in a way, I guess maybe I can only blame myself, since my hang-ups on the punk label, I will admit I have, I have issues with genre labels overall anyway. So I guess just my kind of preoccupation with the word punk and, you know, choosing, choosing 
my own, uh, it's, all, it's all on me, choosing to distance myself from whatever is called punk. It, it only did me a disservice in this case. But yes, as I said, that kind of, you know, just uh, reinforces my argument against and problems with genre labels in general, uh, but that's a discussion for another time. Uh, this album ended up being so much more than just a punk album, uh, as it has such a wide array of sounds and moods. Uh, the lead-off track, Gloria, which is probably Patti Smith's most famous song, is the one that gets all the attention, because it does have that punk sound. I mean, Patti Smith made her career, made her reputation as a punk artist, and uh, one thing, uh, one of the many things I learned uh, in doing the research for this video, uh, after listening to this album was uh, this Gloria, this recording of Gloria. Uh, the first half was written by Patti Smith, or the first segment, I guess you'd say. But the second segment of the song was written by Van Morrison. I had no idea that Van Morrison had written, or, or that, you know, one of his compositions was incorporated into this recording of Gloria. So, you know, boxing Patti Smith into that sound, or even just this album into that sound, uh, can be very, very misleading uh, as to the rest of this album's contents. It's just such a dimensional and varied album, as I mentioned. Uh, one of the standout tracks for me is a song called Birdland. It's nine minutes long, and it's just this sprawling, piano-centric ballad that you know eventually builds up toward a, a swell of sound with, with Patti Smith's wailing vocals. It's just, it's just an, an amazing song, one of, one of the absolute standouts. Uh, and yeah, it's, uh, in a way, it's uh, kind of a shame that the song Gloria kind of takes all the attention away from so many other great songs on this album. And actually, two of the songs on this album have at least titles that I can personally connect with. Uh, there's one track on here called Redondo Beach, uh, and that is a Southern California coastal town that uh, I have a minor connection to with regards to my childhood. Uh, and that, that's a good song, by the way, with a, a bit of a reggae sound to it. You know, just a, another of the uh, several sounds that uh, uh, can be attributed to this album. And uh, the first song on side two is called Kimberly. And of course, that was my sister's name. So it's almost like, you know, I was meant to have this album or meant to listen to it. So yeah, just a couple of personal connections, uh, at least in terms of song titles to me uh, with this album. And then we have another one of the uh, standouts of this album. It's kind of like the centerpiece of side two, which is a nine and a half minute suite called Land. And the first part is a Patti Smith original, and it's kind of like the title track, I guess you'd say, even though it's just part of a track. Uh, and that segues into a cover of the classic R&B song, Land of a Thousand Dances, which you've heard from several artists uh, back in the 60s. And supposedly there is a third part that's based on the classic tune Beyond the Sea, but I was having a lot of trouble finding that buried anywhere in there, so uh, I'll just have to take the, their word for it on, on uh, Wikipedia and elsewhere on the internet. But uh, a couple of inter interesting side notes on here is that Kimberly was co-written by Alan Lanier of Blue Oyster Cult. I assume I'm pronouncing his name properly. And right after that is the song called Breakup, which is an almost power ballad, uh, years before power ballads were really a thing, I think. And that one was co-written by television frontman Tom Verlaine. So, you know, a, a handful of uh, other, other talents from other bands. Uh, contribute their their talents to this album. And uh, another song that I can't go by without mentioning is the closing track, Elegy, which is very subdued and almost delicate. And so there it reveals yet another side to Patti Smith that I had absolutely no idea to expect on this album. So, yes, honestly, uh, before I did this video and before, before I listened to this album, I had already basically pretty much compiled my list of my favorite Backtrack Spotlight albums that I'll be giving to you in, in uh, next week or so. Uh, but I, I had to re revise that list after I listened to this album, honestly. So I, I, I'm not going to tell you where it lands in the list, but uh, just it's a spoiler alert. It's going to be in the top ten. But, uh, I mean, any of, you, any of you who know this album already know that should not be a surprise to you guys. Uh, maybe it's a surprise to you that I like this album so much. But, uh, yeah, an excellent album, one of my favorite... Uh, as I said, one of my favorite Backtrack Spotlight choices for this month. It was so much more than I expected, and, and it is well worth listening to if you have not checked it out yet. And so that'll do it for the final installment of Backtracks for the year 2020 for December. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, hit that like button and share it with your friends. And give me your thoughts, questions, suggestions, or constructive criticisms in the comments section below. Also, scroll down to the description for the link to my Twitter and Instagram feeds, and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.